Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. Photosynthesis and respiration dominate the carbon cycle over very short time scales, but if you stretch your time scale out a little bit, beyond decades to centuries, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, other carbon cycling processes begin to emerge at that scale as other influences on where carbon goes, beyond the rapid day-to-day -day hustle of photosynthesis respiration year by year by year. That 1% of dead marine snow material that reaches the ocean floor and is buried with sediment and particles of sand and mud and silt, that tiny 1% constitutes leakage to the crust of organic carbon and its long-term burial. If it gets down there, it's going to stay there quite a while. Rivers draining into the ocean, sending stuff down there, marine snow, dead plant remains. Even on land, peat bogs compress old peat beneath new peat. And so this stuff gets buried too. And so this small amount of leakage to the crust is constantly going on around the world. In the ocean floor, on the continental shelf, in peat bogs where one day coal may form. This carbon leakage to the crust is tiny. It's a tiny amount, but it's real and it adds up over geologic time. It adds up to about 0.05 gigatons of carbon per year. And that's a tiny amount compared to these other reservoirs I've been talking about. And that means most carbon remains in our environment. Most of it is not buried away on a year-by-year -year basis. It takes geologic time periods to add up to make lots and lots of dead organic carbon go into, go into sedimentary rock. Now here's the thing. Carbon leakage to the crust does not come without a price. Think about the respiration chemical equation, just for a second. Organic carbon that we eat, and we breathe that out as CO2, so we're turning organic carbon into CO2, and we're using up an oxygen to do it every time. To use a chemical term, every mole of organic carbon that gets consumed by bacteria or one of us uses a mole of oxygen. Think about the two sides of the coin of photosynthesis and respiration again. If we had a world, in a world, in a world, where there was no carbon leakage to the crust, where it was perfectly photosynthesis takes carbon down, respiration sends it back up to the atmosphere, then think about this. For every molecule of CO2 that a plant turns into organic carbon, that's then an organic carbon molecule to turn back into CO2 by a consumer. With no organic carbon burial, you would expect, if you give it a couple of seconds thought, that we should not have any oxygen in our atmosphere or very little, because if the process of, of oxygenic photosynthesis is pulling carbon down to make plants that are then consumed when they die, then it's gonna be a closed loop. You're not gonna ever keep much oxygen in the atmosphere, but we do. We have 21% oxygen in our atmosphere, and we have for, as far as we can tell, most of the past half billion years. So how do we do that? It's because of that organic carbon leakage. It's entirely because of that. Because we're burying organic carbon through natural processes, what happens is that that carbon gets buried before it can be decomposed. It gets buried before it can rot. And if it doesn't rot with oxygen, it gets buried instead, then that's an oxygen molecule that doesn't get used up to rot it. it it's still in the atmosphere. And so as the tons of carbon and the gigatons of carbon are buried over geologic ages, you're gonna slowly add up a surplus of oxygen in the atmosphere. That's why we have an oxygen atmosphere. It's because our planet's geology is such that most of the carbon exchange back and forth from the biosphere to the atmosphere is, is a fairly closed loop, but there's a little bit of leakage into the crust. And that leakage allows oxygen to build up in the atmosphere, and that oxygen allows for a much richer biosphere of more consumers and more, more biodiversity. And so what this means in practice is that the oxygen concentration of the atmosphere is, is really dependent upon the rate at which plants grow and they get buried in sediment in the oceans. And why would you assume that these are constant rate? Because they're not. We look at the geologic record of our planet's past and we see examples where the balancing act between the rate of worldwide carbon burial and the rate of plant growth were kind of off kilter from what we're used to today. Specifically, during what's called the Carboniferous period, from about three 59 to about 299 million years ago. It's called the Carboniferous, by the way, because a lot of coal was laid down during that time period. That's why scientists named it that. The coal of the Appalachians is from this Carboniferous period. And it's from this period because at that time there was rampant forest and plant growth around the planet. Forests were young. They'd only evolved a few tens of millions of years before that. And so you had this weird situation, this weird moment in our planet's history 
when suddenly there was this whole new stockpile of carbon on the continent, all these forests growing like crazy, lush growth in a world with much higher CO2 than we have now. And so we had this strange situation which is referred to as the Carboniferous Oxygen Spike. We had a world, in a world, in a world, where forests and plants were growing like crazy across the lowlands of the continents and carbon was being buried much faster than it is today. Much more carbon was being deposited into sediments and compressed down, piling up on the continents as layers of dead, partially rotted wood that just piled up over each other. The total result of this is a massive drawdown of CO2 from the atmosphere, but also a massive spike of oxygen to the atmosphere because of all that carbon that is not being rotted away. It's being buried first. And so during the Carboniferous, we saw oxygen climb to up to about 30%, we think. It's hard to tell exactly, but that's probably as high as it could get. Uh, estimates are apparently that if you go above about 30% oxygen, you can have spontaneous wildfires of dry wood that just with a spark of leaves brushing together can start a fire. And so it would, it would cap the world's oxygen level with that. But this was this time where oxygen was rich in the atmosphere. Insects grew large. Centipedes, cockroaches, insects on land grew to large size because there was more oxygen. And so this strange world existed. High oxygen, giant insects, but then it was also pulling CO2 out of the air. And what happened at the end of this time period is what's called the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, when the party couldn't go on any longer. You're building a world of lush plant life by taking away from the atmosphere the very thing you need, and you're burying that thing carbon before it can rot to come back to the atmosphere again and help you out. The end result when the bill came due was that CO2 dropped enough that it precipitated a worldwide cool period. Not a worldwide ice age, it was glaciation in the South Pole, but it was generally a cooler planet and it collapsed this rainforest that had spread across the continents. The carbon cycle of our planet can do some strange things and if processes that operate on different time scales start changing their rates then you'll see results like this. Throughout Earth's entire history, as long as there have been land plants and as long as there's been algae falling through the water column in the oceans to collect on the bottom, we have had organic matter trapped away in sediments, stored away in a form we call kerogen. Kerogen is a generalized term that refers to a reduced form of almost oily type of black organic matter residue that mixes, that is mixed in with the sedimentary uh, rock particles in sedimentary rock like shale or what is now tar sands, mudstones, silt stones. If you look at outcrops of black shale, for example, they're black because the shale contains a lot of organic matter. Disseminated in that rock is a few percent organic matter as kerogen. It's basically the same thing as fossil fuels, but it's finely disseminated throughout rock, present in most fine-grained sedimentary rock to some concentration or another, but it's not enough to mine. It can produce methane, and that can be pulled out of the ground as shale bed methane, but I'll talk about that in a separate lecture. Typically, fossil fuels are, in fact, the result of this same process of sedimentary material mixing with organic material during deposition. But fossil fuels are basically high purity organic carbon deposits that have been processed geologically. We go after the highest grade, highest purity organic carbon deposits in the crust because it pays off to do so. Kerogen, not so much. It won't pay to, to mine that stuff. But kerogen is a form of organic carbon that will last. Once you put it into a rock, once that sedimentary material full of organic matter cooks down and hardens into rock, it tends to stay there a long time. The residence time for carbon in sedimentary rock is in the hundreds of millions of years. And so you tend to store that carbon away from the biosphere, away from the oceans, away from short-term cycling for as long as it's in there. But it doesn't stay in there forever. Eventually, rocks will get exposed at the Earth's surface and are subject to weathering. Rain, wind, freeze-thaw, plant roots, bacteria that result in the erosion of the rock from rainfall, dissolved carbonic acid, in rainfall will slowly etch away at rock. It doesn't have to be limestone. It'll etch away slowly at even silicate rock. And so by chemical weathering, by physical weathering, any kind of sedimentary kerogen that's exposed at the surface is going to be weathered back into the air. And that's exactly what happens to it. The kerogen in sedimentary rock weathers in our atmosphere, biologically and chemically, back to CO2. So if you look at sedimentary rock exposed being pounded by water waves or scoured by the wind. Whatever organic carbon was in that rock, it's going back into the air. And this happens normally across the planet. This is a normal part of how our planet's carbon cycle operates. We, when we extract fossil fuels to power our civilization, are doing essentially the same thing that happens when sedimentary rock is exposed naturally at the Earth's surface 
weathers and returns CO2 back to the air. Chemically, it's essentially the same thing. The difference is that the time scales are very different. We see natural weathering take place piecemeal, spread out here and there across continents, slow weathering of the rock. It takes a long time. Not much is weathering at any, at any moment. But if you look at fossil fuel extraction, we are, of course, going after the highest grade, highest purity deposits we can find, and we're using them specifically to burn them to CO2 to generate power. That's what they're there for in our civilization once we extract them. So fossil fuel extraction and use is essentially a kind of acceleration of what is otherwise a natural process. Accelerated by orders of magnitude, by the way, not just a little bit. But it's nothing new in terms of the basics of how carbon shuttles around on our world. If you look at, go back to this diagram I put together before of these boxes, we've got the short-term carbon cycle of photosynthesis respiration pulling CO2 out of the air. We've got most of that recycling back to the air, but some of it going into soils and marine sediments where it can reside for maybe decades or centuries. And eventually that stuff is either gonna be weathered back to active mobilization at the Earth's surface, or it's going to be buried and held captive by geology for millions and millions of years. The rate of burial of organic carbon on our planet is only about 0.05 gigatons of year. And the weathering back to the air is about the same. Tiny amounts, but slow, relentless juggernaut processes that will take their due over a given amount of time that it takes them to respond. Plants and animals are fast. Soils are slower. Rocks are slower still.